trustees, our second and last information item is the review of our external buildings assessment. So, and I know Dr. Swift will have opening remarks, but we, over a year ago, uh, asked for somebody to um, help us <laughs> see from an objective point of view the state of all of our buildings. And so, Dr. Swift, can you describe that work? And I think trustees behind you and for the viewing public, those tables have the end results of this work. Um, so you can see there's a report there for every single building that we have. And in, I think each trustee has the same one for just Burns Park. So this is how big each one is. Uh, they're significant, just significant work. Um, and then Dr. Swift, go ahead and provide an overview. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President and trustees and members of the community. It was indeed about 18 months ago, uh, following the passing of the sinking fund increase, um, and we had promised the community that we would take that increased sinking fund and do everything we could to move the move the barometer on the condition of our buildings. Our buildings average 63 years of age, so it's not a simple proposition. They are old, and uh, unfortunately, due to two decades of a downturn in the funding for public education in the state of Michigan, um, you know, facilities, maintenance, and upkeep gets deferred in order to preserve the classroom and take care of our staff. And so we knew we had a lot of work to do. We have been busy with the sinking fund. We've completed many million dollars worth of work in trustees. One of my best indicators of our progress is that before the sinking fund increase, you received more than one email from me per week telling you how many roofs were leaking, I even began, all of us began to dread rain because we knew that it would mean that an average of a dozen roofs were actively leaking on any given day in the district. I'm not proud to share that, but yet as superintendent, it is my job to speak the facts over this situation. And so we were in dire need, our community, Many, many thanks and much gratitude to our community for supporting that sinking fund increase. And we have used every single dollar to invest back into the infrastructure of our schools. And I'm pleased to report that infrastructure failure already doesn't drive every day of our work like it did um, at one time. And so, um, and yet, the board asked 18 months ago, and our team recommended that it was time to do it, to take a thorough external analysis. So what has been occurring over many, many months is that engineers and physical plant facilities folk, um, external to our organization, have uh, traveled into and climbed on top of and went underneath and inspected the exterior, the interior of every single one of our buildings. And you're right, Madam President, these reports are the result of that external analysis. And so I'm very proud to bring forward this evening um, Mr. Emil Lautzana, who is our Executive Director of Facilities, and Mr. Marios Dimitriou, our Assistant Superintendent of Facilities and Operations. They're going to walk us through this work uh, in a summary fashion, because as you can see, uh, Trustee Mitchell is standing back there. The work is massive. But they're going to walk us through a summary of the work. I do want to extend my deep gratitude to Finance Committee, who plowed through this with us and helped us to improve this initial report. Now, because we are making adjustments on the Board of Education, we um, and we probably would do this anyway, but we will repeat this theme as we bring on our two new trustees um, in ensure that our community is well updated. Uh, I'm proud tonight because we're keeping a promise we made to get a thorough and complete look at the condition of our facilities. So buckle your seatbelt. It is a large amount of work um, and the need is great. So with that, Mr. Lautzana, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss our facility uh, infrastructure condition assessment that was conducted recently 
Um, we'll discuss briefly the uh, sort of quality of infrastructure around the country and also in the state of Michigan, and then dive into Ann Arbor Public Schools, um, review the facilities condition assessment, um, talk about some potential capital investment scenarios, and then we'll review some of the possibilities. What could we become under some of those capital investment scenarios? So nationally, K-12 schools are evaluated by the American Society of Civil Engineers along with other infrastructure in the country, such as roads, bridges, airports, et cetera, and they have a grading scale. And I just wanna read a little bit of this because some of these terms will, will come back um, later in the presentation and have deeper meaning. Um, a rated infrastructure, and I'm jumping to the last sentence here, is a facility that meets modern standards for functionality and are resilient to withstand most natural disasters and severe weather events. Uh, jumping down to a B grade, they are safe and reliable with minimal capacity issues and minimal risk. Um, on to C, the infrastructure in the system or network is in fair to good condition. It follows generally, it shows general signs of deterioration and requires attention. Some elements exhibit significant deficiencies in condition and functionality with increasing vulnerability to risk. A poor at risk piece of infrastructure uh, is mostly below standard with men, many elements exhibiting, approaching the end of their useful service life. A large portion of the system exhibits significant deteriorations. Conditions and capacities are of significant concern with strong risk of failure. And an F infrastructure is unfit for purpose and many of the components of the system exhibit imminent signs of failure. And so they look at all the schools in the country and we get a D plus on our infrastructure. It's a failing underinvested infrastructure. The annual need is about $87 billion. Our annual investment is 49 million. We're 38 billion dollars behind every year in our investment in our school infrastructure. Michigan, we get a D plus as well. We're right in the middle of the pack um, with everybody else under investing in our school infrastructure. <clears throat> and we're on our own. Michigan is one of only a few states that has no state level funding for capital investment in school facilities. I, I, Hate to say this, but our southern neighbors in Ohio invest significantly at the state level in their school buildings. Um, they've also set a green building standard for all those buildings, and they're in the process of modernizing every single K-12 building in the state of Ohio. It's a massive building program. We have no such state level support. So here's what we have, 35 principal buildings uh, essentially 3.5 million square feet of building on uh, average age 63 years, uh, 762 acres of land, about 18,000 students and 2,000 give or take staff depending on how you do the math. So here we have it. Average year built is 1956, average age 63 years old. And you'll see we had what we're calling the original build. That's your community high school, Burns Park, and others. Those were all built post-World War I, and they were built in rapid succession in a certain type of construction that we're all familiar with, the brick and limestone construction with the thick walls, the high ceilings. Um, there wasn't a lot of activity after 1923. A couple of schools came online, and then we had the post-World War II building boom, the greatest generation, and these folks cranked them out. It was a different kind of construction. It was a, let's say, a, a, a more economical construction and they needed these buildings fast. We had rapid urbanization, we had the baby boom, lots of kids and lots of schools going online. In some cases, um, we had buildings two coming on in one year, Eber White and Tappan, both in 1950. That's hard to believe, those are some significant buildings. Um, 51, 52, 53, 54, 56, 57, two more come online, Dickon and Pattengill. That's the, the, the big build there. It slows down into the 70s. 
Um, and we haven't done much since except for Skyline, which was constructed or opened in 19, uh, 2008. Another tool we're using more recently in the climate change era to evaluate our schools is temperature. So we took essentially through our building automation system, average temperatures in schools. The first one was in September. I'm sorry, the first was in, was in um, May uh, when we had a, a heat wave at the end of the school year. And then twice at the beginning of the school year, we took temperatures and kind of averaged all this together. And you can see um, the implications of this heat on our students. And we know that Students, when they're in these kinds of conditions, when it's too hot, their cognitive function goes down, their off-task behavior goes up, and essentially learning suffers in this kind of a condition. So this is another way to look at our infrastructure. So we commissioned EMG through a, through a bid process, and they were selected to conduct this analysis. It's essentially a life cycle engineering analysis. So they look at all of the components of the building, they assign a useful life to it, and then they, they estimate how much life is left in that component. So some components might have a 15-year useful life, some have a 20, 30, even longer useful life. Um, they do this through walkthrough inspection, as Dr. Swift mentioned, down in the tunnels, up on the roof, all through the building and the grounds, and they use mathematical models to complete their analysis and they identify needed infrastructure investments and the risks associated with deferring those investments. EMG is the largest provider of these services in the, in the country. They, in the last five years, they've done uh, 7 million, 700 million square feet, again, worth a 3.5, so um, they have done a lot of s assessments like this. They have a lot of professionals and they have some clients um, Hartford, Connecticut Public Schools, Chicago Public Schools, and DC Public Schools have all used EMG for similar analysis. So they look at a number of things, the building structure, foundation, stairwells, building envelope, that's the walls, the windows, the doors and the roof, the enclosure of the building, the site, parking lots, walkways, et cetera, building interiors, doors and finishes, cabinets, lockers, all of that. MEPF services, which is your mechanical heating and cooling system, electrical system and lighting, plumbing system, and your fire safety system. Um, and then equipment and furniture, furnishings, your kitchen equipment, pool equipment, scoreboards, theater systems, all of these other sort of ancillary pieces of equipment that support the function of the school. So this is what they found. Outdated classrooms. outdated teacher's lounges, old theaters and MPR rooms, kitchens in need of repair, new equipment, finishes, antiquated lights and ceiling systems, antiquated interior doors, flooring past its useful life, <coughs> Vinyl tile has a 15-year useful life. Much of it in the district is significantly past that, that, uh, that age. Elevators. Our elevators, essentially, we have one breaking every week. We have one down right now. The technician will be there in the morning to try to get it back up online. These essentially all need to be completely replaced. They're old and dysfunctional. Plumbing. Our mechanical rooms, um, the day they visited the one on, I guess that would be on the left, there was actually a circulating pump that was leaking and that's why there's water on the floor there. Um, that's, a cent that's the central air fan for a building on the right. Exhaust fans, these clear out bathrooms, kitchens, uh, chem you know, uh, uh, science labs, things like that. A lot of these are past service life. Uh, these are fire alarm panels. Many of these were identified as out of date and need of replacement, in addition to all of the sensors and other devices around the building that 
are tied into these. These are building control systems. These are the brains of the building. I think this one on the right, I saw that on eBay some time ago. Um, it uh, might have some antique value. Um, these turn on the heat, turn off the heat. They control the air conditioning if the building has air conditioning. Um, very old stuff. Electrical systems. Boilers. These are not cheap. Unit ventilators, these are the distribution systems inside of classrooms that bring in fresh air and also heat. Um, a lot of those are well past service life. Exterior stairs and other concrete work. Exterior doors and windows, past service life. <coughs> Pavement, now that may not look too bad with the alligator cracking, but Based on the look of that, in about two years, this is going to be a lot of potholes with plowing and salting and lots of traffic and everything like that. And we have been able to do quite a few parking lots with the sinking fund, but there's a lot more to do. And the facades. We have those 1923 original build buildings. A lot of that stuff from the 50s was built with brick and limestone. We have not invested in those facades and they need a lot of attention. And so this is the summary of their findings. In EMG's opinion that the facilities were found to be in overall good condition to fair condition and have, an have had an adequate level of maintenance over the past few years. However, without substantial upfront investment, many of the school could facility condition index and that, we'll talk about this a little more, but that's the ratio of deferred maintenance to the value of the property, um, will fall into the poor rating within just a few years. <clears throat> and so over a 20 year look, this is uh, the findings from EMG, uh, that we need to invest $823 million into our buildings, and you'll see uh, the various buckets and categories that that falls into. Um, electrical, HVAC, interiors, roofing, life safety, uh, conveying, that's elevators, roofing, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and so this looks at, and these, these systems time out over time. As I mentioned, they have a useful life. And then the way the report, you know, the way the the math works out after the service life. The assumption is you replace it, and then it has another 15 or 20 or 30 years on it. So the orange is the identified needs, and the blue is the available funds through the sinking fund to address those needs. So you'll see we have about a $70 million gap currently, and that will add to an additional $29 million gap next year. And this will accrue over time as we continue to defer maintenance. That bucket of needs, if you will, will continue to grow. And of course, we'll use what funds we have to get those most critical needs to keep our buildings operational. So this is kind of how the, this looks over time. Over two years, it's a $103 million gap. <coughs> Over five years, 227 million. And over 10 years, 282 million. And then the sinking fund expires, and off we go, $602 million facility needs gap. So that's a lot to think about 20 years. So we're going to zoom in for a second just on five years. So it's a little more manageable. Um, that's about $344 million of needs identified in the assessments. And you'll see the categories here again. Um, same bigger buckets, electrical, interiors, HVAC, uh, fire protection, some of the others. Um, and just to give you a sense, this is what one of the report pages that summarizes all the needs over 20 years looks like. We're not, I, I know nobody can see that, but I just wanted sort of show the depth of detail that they're going to. So we're going to look at three schools. Um, Allen Elementary, built in 1961,
Community High School, built in 1922, and Carpenter Elementary, built in 1953. They're all about the same size in the neighborhood of 60,000 square feet, um, but they have dramatically different investment needs. Um, Allen, um, tragically, but also um, on the upside, had a flood. And so we had the opportunity a couple years ago to basically completely rebuild that building. And so it is the newest, most up-to-date building in our portfolio. And over five years, only needs a $2 million investment. And we'll look at that a little more in detail, or $31 per square foot. Community High School, built in 1922, part of that original build. Um, an investment over five years of about $8 million, $135 a square foot. Carpenter, built more recently in 1953, needs an $11 million investment, or $218 per square foot. Um, as I mentioned before, there's differences in the, in the quality or the type of construction from those original buildings to a lot of that stuff from the 60s and 70s was built quickly. We needed a lot of infrastructure. Um, there were also trends that were into making things thin and light as possible. Um, that building needs the most investment. So looking at Allen a little more in detail, <laughs> There's some additional HVAC, heating, venting, ventilation, air conditioning work, additional electrical equipment, and some additional interior improvements. Um, and inside of the, the facility condition reports, you'll see tables and charts like this. This is the interior doors, and you'll note the condition is good. These are new doors. They're in good shape. They're not cycling out. Um, on this chart, I will point you to this column here, RUL. That stands for Remaining Useful Life. So each of these systems um, coming across, it identifies the remaining useful life, and once it reaches zero, then it becomes a need in that fiscal year. And so you'll see there's a lot of 15s and 19s and 14s here. Um, you can see the vinyl tile. Throughout the building, vinyl tile is in good condition. Replace it in 14 years. That's because it's only one year old. It has a 15-year life. When we do need to do that, they estimate it's $240,000 to redo the floor in the entire building. And this is some of their mechanical equipment. You'll see a lot of 14s. This is all stuff that's new. However, we didn't do some of the boilers when we did the redo. So there's some additional investment needed in that mechanical equipment, but it's in fair condition and it has a three to four to five year use, remaining useful life. So looking at community, um, they also need HVAC work. And you remember from our uh, chart of heat, community was at the top of that list. Um, so this does include air conditioning. Um, electrical, fire protection, this building does not have an adequate fire protection system. All of this adds up over five years to an $8 million investment, $135 per square foot. And you'll see some of those charts again, and we've moved into fair, fair, good, poor, fair, fair, good, poor. So some of these systems are starting to exhibit <coughs> signs of significant wear. And this is again one of those charts that shows the remaining useful life. And you can see the numbers have gotten a little bit lower. We've got a lot of fours, eights, seven, sixes, things that are coming due to be replaced. Not to mention we have the issue with the overheating at community. So looking at Carpenter, their five year needs are, are extensive. Heating, uh, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, exterior improvements, doors, windows, and finishes, um, and other things, the roofing system, um, and other interior improvements. And you see now we're getting into the fair and the poor condition of some of these components. And looking at our remaining useful life, Five five zero zero zero. These are components that essentially are past useful life. 
Some of those may or may not be operational. Um, some things were replaced more recently in zeros and sixes and threes. So there's a lot of work to be done at Carpenter. So how do we make all, sense of all of this? There's a lot of information, it's a lot of details. Um, so we use this FCI, Facility Condition Index, and it's essentially the ratio of your deferred maintenance to the value of the asset. So if you think of a $100,000 house, just as a round number, if you, let's say, your roof is a little older, it's not leaking yet, but you know you need to replace it, and that costs about $5,000, and that's the only thing you need, so that's 5,000 over your 100,000, you're at a 5%, so you're in the good category. Well, let's say your furnace is not all that great and you had the guy out to fix it, and your roof is actually leaked a little bit and the guy came and patched it, but you think you can get all that done for 10,000, you're in the fair condition. As you move into an older condition, your windows now are rattling in the frames, your furnace has died two more times, you had an active leak that took out some of your drywall, you've moved into the poor condition. Once you get 30% to 50% of the value of your house, so you need to invest $30,000 to $50,000 in your house to bring it back to a good condition, you've entered the critical stage, and once you get to uh, over 50%, you're entering the, the time where you would consider divesting from that asset. <clears throat> your your house needs so much work that it might be time to simply replace it. <clears throat> so these are our schools. And currently, um, we have an average FCI of 12%. That's across our entire portfolio. And you'll see some of, here's Allen. And this column here, it's a little confusing. This is without the sinking fund. And this column, the second column is with the sinking fund. So we're seeing the, how much of a bite of this are we taking out with the sinking fund. And you'll see we have, uh, with the sinking fund, six buildings in good condition. This is over two years. 14 buildings in fair condition, 13 in poor, and two in the critical condition. Carpenter being one of those. The other one is uh, north side. The older part of the building did not get the attention it needed at the time. So continuing, assuming under a scenario, we continue to have the sinking fund. Um, and five years out, we now only have Allen, which was recently renovated, hanging on in the good condition We've got no buildings in the fair condition, 18 buildings in poor condition, 13 in critical, and three have entered that divest range where the needed investment is half of the value of the asset. And this is the 10-year look, just assuming we run with the sinking fund. Allen now has dropped into the poor condition we have none in fair or good. We have 19 in critical and 11 in the divest category. There are 11 buildings that essentially we would consider completely renovating and remodeling or replacing. And I know this community would never go 20 years without additional investment in its schools, but since we're running mathematical models, this is where we end up. We had to invent a new divest plus category for this one um, because the, the needed investment was more than the value of the building. It, was, it would be so run down that it would cost more to fix it up than if we were to just build a new one. Yes. So this is at a macro level. Again, the data that we saw before um, Two-year investment needs, five-year investment needs, 10-year, and 20-year. And our sinking fund is approximately, we have about $200 million left of sinking fund that will come in over the next eight years to help take a bite out of this. 
So what does this condition assessment include and what does it not include? So it includes renewing our existing infrastructure. It does not include the costs of adding space for more students. It does not include additions, accommodations for growth. It includes maintaining our schools in a good to fair condition in that kind of B, C, A level. It does not include maintaining our schools in a good to exceptional condition. We added, we asked the uh, assessors to include certain things that we thought were important to the community. Um, air conditioning added to all schools. Um, implementing solar power and geothermal where that was feasible economically. Uh, security enhancements. Um, some of the things that it does not include, other pieces of infrastructure that we need to refresh that, that the EMG does not evaluate in this, uh, refreshing our furniture. We've done a lot of that recently, but we have a lot of that left, and eventually that will time out again and need to get replaced. Uh, it does not include refreshing our busing fleet. It does not include refreshing our technology, projectors, teacher laptops, all of that stuff. It does include building our standard classroom environments to a code minimum level. And what is required by code, that's what costs are included. It does not include going beyond that to optimize our classrooms for healthy environments. It does include an adder for union wages, prevailing wage, and it does not include constructing new and replacement schools. It assumes we're refreshing what we have. If, if we're at a 30% FCI, we put that 30% back in the building, and that's the, the program. It does not include building that new school um, and modernizing in that way. So some of these other needs that we have. We estimate at base on our current rate of growth, we need about $10 million a year to accommodate that growth. That's assuming we actually build additions and not continue to do modulars. Refreshing our furniture, about a million dollars a year. Buses, $2 million a year. Technology, quite expensive, $5 million a year. And if we choose to go for that good to exceptional level of school facilities, the U of M quality building, we estimate another $5 million a year. That's $23 million over 20 years at 3% inflation. That's $618 million. So we have what's identified in the facilities condition assessment. The other needs, not in the facilities condition assessment, and the total 20-year needs of the district at $1.4 billion. And this is the gap between what we have to make these investments. There's the $222 million from the sinking fund, which is without that, we would be in a completely different place in this district, and it's very helpful to have that asset, um, those, those funds to help, but the need is great. And so just to put a graphic on it, this is what that looks like. Um, the, the red line on top is the, is the needs. Uh, the yellow line is the sinking fund, which tapers out, and the green line is the gap, and this is where the sinking fund runs out and things start to take off um, as our needs increase. So now I'm going to hand it off to uh, Marios Demetrio, who will take us through the next section. <coughs> Thank you very much, Emil. Good evening, Board of Education and Dr. Swift. I'm so glad I'm able to talk to you tonight. Um, first, I'd like to go um, through a few slides to explain what the bond issue is, and, and, um, and then we'll get into some scenarios and, and so forth. So. Um, First of all, a bond issue uh, has to be approved by voters. Um, and the voters have to approve an amount. They, they don't actually approve a millage. So whatever uh, millage we need to levy to pay those bonds, that's what, that's what determines uh, the millage. Um, so um, all of the work must be contracted. And none of the work can be done by our employees. 
um, and none of the work can be paid to our employees. So everything has to be contracted out, and that's just um, Michigan law. So um, there are different uh, regulations on how much you can actually um, levy. So um, the, the amount that is allowable in the, uh, the limit in the law is 15% of your taxable value. So our taxable value is a little bit over $9 billion. So the 15% is approximately one point, almost $1.4 billion. We actually have $160 million of, of debt. So uh, our capacity is approximately $1.2 billion, additional capacity. Um, some of the, uh, our neighbors, all of our neighbors actually, in the county, this is the, the meals that they're levying for their debt. So um, we're, we're at 2.45, and the next one is actually a seven. Uh, Ypsilanti happens to have two uh, debts. One, the, the seven is actually uh, in the general fund, and this is in the, the bond fund, in the, in the debt fund, basically. So some of the, uh, the ones that are highlighted in blue are the ones that we're currently using. Um, and, and Dr. Swift was correct. We, we had uh, the technology bond that was passed in 2012, and then we had three series. And then in, in May of 2018, we issued the last series. So we have received all the $46 million. Also, we had the $33 million that we passed in 2015. And we uh, did it in two series. $27 million was issued in 2015, and the $6 million we issued in 2018. So we issued $14 million altogether last, last May, basically. So we have received all of the um, funds that we're supposed to receive, we have already received, and, and we have approximately uh, one more refresh to do in technology. And then uh, all of the money basically that we have is, is pretty much committed to the projects. Uh, we just haven't finished doing all the projects. So uh, these are uh, constructing new buildings, additions to existing buildings, remodeling, um, and, and so forth. Um, and then acquiring school buses, which um, this is something that we're doing with our 2015 bonds. Um, improving sites, athletic facilities and so forth, which we're going to be doing some in, in the summer. Um, so these are all the things that you're allowed to do with, with a bond issue, purchasing land, and so forth. Um, uh, technology, which we already do. Um, we can, when we find opportunities to refund our bond issues and get lower interest rates and so forth, we, we do that, and we've done that many times in the past. <clears throat> so the, the bonds, the maximum they can have is 30 years. Um, and then also they're more restricted based on the type of asset that you're buying. So, for example, school buses, it's only, those bonds can only be six years. Or furniture is only 10 years and technology is five years. So um, they're limited to the life, the useful life of what we're buying. So. Um, all of these funds are audited, and, and we have them audited every year, and, and then you need to have a, a separate audit when it's actually completed. Um, so, um, what is happening uh, to our millage? So currently, uh, we are at 2.45. So, next year, we're expecting that the tax base will grow at 4.5%. 4 this year it grew at 5.19. The year before it grew at six, uh, I can't remember, it was over 6%. So, and then we're estimating in the, um, after that that it's gonna be approximately 2.5% on the average. So based on that, um, we see a millage uh, that after this year we go down to 2.4, then 2.24, and so forth and so forth, and then in 28, in 29, we will finish with that debt. This is very important to um, uh, this 2.45. It is, keep that in mind because we're gonna come up, come up to it later. 
maybe not that much later. So um, I, I wanted to show a little bit of a tax. See, these are all the taxable values in, in the school district. So we're in the city, obviously, about 64% of our taxable values in the city. And then the other 36% is in the townships. And Pittsfield Township is the biggest one of, of all. And then you see the number of parcels that we have. And this includes not just the residents, but also the businesses and, and so forth. So there are f 55 parcels, 55,000 parcels. Our tax base approximately in any changes daily. <coughs> Um, so this is um, nine, a little, you know, a little bit over nine billion. So the average taxable value is approximately 164,000. Um, and then, uh, looking at just residential um, um, values and so forth, we have approximately 45 percent of the tax base. Um, and the average, um, and this is um, a couple years old. This is the information. I couldn't get all the, the current information. I got current information from the city of Ann Arbor. So this 119 for this year is 126, um, 126,000. Uh, I couldn't get the other information. Um, so, so from a couple years ago, um, the average taxable value is 117. So it's not that far off for, for residential homes. I know the values, the market values are way higher, but the taxable values is what is used to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. So that just gives you an idea of, um, I just wanted to give you an idea of what is. Um, and then, so um, we have different options which we'll, we'll, we'll go through and, and then we'll come back to this one. So in option, so we have different options. This option is, remember that 2.45 meals that we're levying. So just keeping the 2.45 for 30 years. So uh, we work with the financial advisors which, which used to be started Barch and now they're actually with PFM. So the same people that we've been working for many, many years, same financial advisors, and we work with them to get the figures. So with just keeping the 2.45 mil <coughs> for 30 years at the same level that everybody's paying right now, is there, is, there will be no change in the current millage rate, and then we can raise $533 million. Um, so the average millage over, the, over this life will be about 1.88 and the maximum will be 2.45. <coughs> so the advantage is that there's no increase to the current millage. It's, it, it stays the same. The um, disadvantage is that in the beginning, you're only receiving $16 million and there's not enough <coughs> funds generated in the beginning because um, we feel that we're probably going to need the kind of construction that is necessary. You're going to need a couple buildings in the beginning so you can move kids into those new buildings and then you can go in those buildings and renovate them. The kind of renovations that are necessary, you can't do over 10 weeks over the summer. So um, this doesn't give you that option. And also, there's, based on the needs that we've seen, where it's, the gap right now is about 1.2 billion, if you, if you want to do all those things, then this doesn't, doesn't get you there. So we can do a lot of work, but, um, and then if, if we are, uh, with this option, we recommend because it's just keeping, um, <coughs> basically the same millage, there's no increase to the millage rate mm -hmm. uh, that we recommend that will be like a May 2019 election. Because that 2.45, you know if you do it next year, it's gonna be 2.40. Mm -hmm. So if you're levying less, if you wanna keep it the same, then you're not gonna be able to raise, the it's gonna be less money that you're raising.
Uh, the second option is to issue $750 million <coughs> of debt, and that would require an increase from the current millage of 2.45 to uh, at 3.2, which is a 0.75 additional mill to the current millage. Um, and then you, you see at the beginning, you're able to get $50 million. So that is, um, that is enough to, um, to you generate some money at the beginning so you can build some schools and, and, and we can do what is, uh, what is needed. And then this will maintain a good FCI learning environment at our schools. Um, the, the negative part about it is that this is an increase from the current millage. Um, and then when you have an increase, there's a lot more, it's a different campaign. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, um, so, so that will require more time. Um, and we're recommending that this will be a November 19 uh, election. And so Mr. Dimitro, I would just insert that we would then listen to the board and develop the package and a plan and a plan that would be necessary. Mm -hmm. So that would provide for that time and it would um, have all of that line up in time mm -hmm. to do a community campaign. So thank you. Thank you. So the next um, one that it will be $1 billion and then um, I think we will be able uh, to basically maintain that exceptional uh, learning environment that uh, Mr. Lozana was referring to uh, earlier. But with uh, $1 billion, then we need to increase it to 4.15, which is approximately 1.7 additional mil to the current millage. So again, uh, this is an increase. So again, we would recommend that we would do that in November. If the board chose this option, that we go in November. I'm going to go back to a few slides. And, and um, so in option one, basically the, the, the rate, the millage remains the same. What I, I sh I'm showing up if it's a, what would happen to different taxable values at 100, um, 150, 200, then all properties in our, the 163,000, it was the taxable value of all the properties in a school district, and then the residential taxable value, which was, it's a couple years old. Um, if an arbor is about 126, <coughs> I will venture to say maybe 125,000 yeah. is where it's at right now. Uh, but I didn't get that information until we came to the board meeting. Uh, they just called me back. So um, then option two, you will see what it means, the, the kind of increases that we're talking annually. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the, the option three. And this last column is basically the, the, the average, uh, you know, if you're interested in the residential and then, then the businesses and, and, and so forth when they're mixed in the last two columns is actually a school district's averages. So I'm going to go back to, um, I think we talked a little bit about this. Um, so um, if the board chooses, uh, usually we have to submit a paperwork approximately 63 days before an election. So. <coughs> Uh, if the board chooses option number one, then um, then by January th January 30th is the um, last board meeting that we have. We have to submit our paperwork by February 12th at by four o'clock to the county clerk. So the board meeting that you have before that is on January 30th. So um, that decision will have to be made on on January 30th. And then all the other steps is actually steps that the clerk uh, will have to take and, and so forth. Um, if the board chooses option two or option three, then that will be November 7th or 8th of uh, next year. So that would be like we have to submit it sometime in September or August uh, to, 
to the county clerk. Uh, so these are just steps that the county clerk will have to take, will take. So um, I think I'm gonna hand it back to Emil to, to close and Thank you, Marios. And um, I, I realize that the chapter one or part one of our presentation was quite sobering and, and troubling. It certainly is to me and the people that work in my department. So I wanted to kind of close on an up note. Um, <laughs> there is an up note. This will be, this will be interesting. And um, the question essentially is what could we create? We have an opportunity in this community to refresh our entire building stock. And we've talked a lot and, um, in these meetings about learning environments, teaching styles, equity, a lot of other things. So the question is, what could we create? And so this is what Bloomfield Hills created. This is Dexter, Dexter High School, which was completed a few years ago. And it's important to note that these buildings, when they're refreshed and they're new, they're so much easier to maintain. Mm -hmm. And the resources are, that we pull from the general fund for cleaning, for routine maintenance, and all of that in a building like this is significantly lower than in a, an, a building of, of significant age and, and <coughs> deferred investment. Um, this is a net zero energy school in Virginia. And I just love these little, these little cubby spaces here. Good daylight and views. Ample size classrooms. This is a school in uh, Washington State that's kind of got a nature theme to it. it. The building ties very much to the outdoor environment. The nature is brought in through views. And again, it's modernized, easy to maintain. Um, and so District of Columbia, which we mentioned earlier, about 120 schools, so they're, they're about three and a half times our size. They've set on a complete modernization program of all of their schools. Over the last, uh, since the early 2000s, they've spent $4 billion, and they're not done. They're spending 300 to $400 million annually on capital projects for their buildings. And by 2025, all buildings will have a significant capital investment. They're going school by school by school all around the city, 120 of them. And it's a big program, and they've been working with a group called Perkins Eastman, and they've done some evaluation. Um, this was a fairly rigorous study that they did with surveying from several of the modernized schools and several of the ones that hadn't been modernized yet. Mm -hmm. And the students are 25% more proud of their school in a modernized environment. They're happier, calmer, healthier, and they're more ready to learn. And some of the things that we talked about in the sustainability preview several months ago. They're more satisfied with the thermal comfort in the building. They're more satisfied with the quality of the air. They're more satisfied with their acoustical environment. And they're more satisfied with daylight. So these are students and teachers who are happier and prouder to be in these buildings every day. And they're functioning better and they're more satisfied with their environment. And so this is what that looks like in DC. Again, the daylight, the views, the modernized finishes, the space, the storage, the easy to maintain hallways, the daylight, I love the solar panels and the daylight wells and all of that, the reading nook. These are just a few others from around the country. This is another one in Virginia, a, K, a K-8 building. This is one of my favorites in this. This is a, a, an urban school in Cleveland. It's a multi-story downtown K-8. This is in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I especially like this exterior here. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, it's well constructed. Those are, that is built to last. That is not a, an exterior that's gonna need a lot of maintenance. 
You have a maker steam lab in the bottom right. This is a new high school um, in Minnesota. Again, the same themes here, the, the new finishes, the daylight, the flexible spaces, and they've got a cafe on the upper part there. And this is an addition to a school in California. They added on this uh, innovation lab, and it's got several different rooms, and they, the students come there and they do various uh, STEM, STEAM type activities. Um, and it's also very engaging and open to the public to engage with what they're doing. So that's the end of the presentation. And the question is, what can we create? Thank you. I just want to point out, we've got the right team to accomplish whatever the board sees in your wisdom is the right work to do. And so the promises we make we will organize, it will be detailed as what you've seen tonight, and we will deliver uh, on those promises. And that has not always been the case in the past, and I think part of the trauma some of you have lived was the downturn happening right in the middle of Skyline, so your costs were, I mean, you just had a lot of challenges other than salamanders. Um, and that was its own challenge. So um, I just wanted to take a moment to say, this is the team uh, to get done what we are gonna get done. Thank you. Whatever that is. I know it took a little longer than we had hoped for to get this report, but I think it was worth it. Uh, Cause this is a job well done and all the numbers are here. Like when you look at the beginning, if you're breezing through any of these, all of these um, charts are in here, all the data is in here that feeds into those columns that talk about the real uh, requirement. Um, and then it's, it's up to the board to kind of create your own destiny. And that's very possible here. We've got example after example of that. Um, so the only limitation is ourselves. But thank you so much for presenting this work so well, making sense of it. This is um, thousands of pages, I think, of actual data to go through, so to get this to, is it 100 slides? Something like that? Mm. Yeah, to get it to 100 slides is not bad, <laughs> actually, with a lot of it being pictures. But I love that you spent the time also showing a little bit of what's possible, what people are doing now. I think those are the kinds of things people come here expecting, that we've, we've done some of that, and we, this is the story of Michigan, as Trustee Mitchell said. You know, we, we have not been investing. Our schools look like how we've been investing in our children. And, um, and that's true. So local, I think, is your more effective strategy. Ask for what you need, do the work, make a compelling case in November, and you've got your best shot at uh, doing something substantive and meaningful for kids. Thank you. All right, thank you.